Okay, so we'll start with Hadley versus Baxendale on this topic of remedies for breach of contract. Before I start this case, I just want to briefly show you one thing which we discussed the other day. Remember, we discussed this idea of uh, the notification of uh, particular sections of the Act. Okay, so uh, when we were discussing, what was what is the topic that we were discussing? I forget the topic, but we discussed the idea that when an act receives the assent of the president it doesn't necessarily have the force of law okay because it has to be further at the way that many of the acts are now being written uh, in, in, in the modern times uh, they you see the section 1 subsection 2 this is from the company's amendment bill 2016 okay when we were discussing the companies act of 2013 and uh, the mca ebook that uh, you know quickly updates all the amendments and gives you the dates of notification okay so this is a slightly off topic discussion not related to hadley versus baxendale just something to be aware of you see here the company's amendment bill 2016 this was introduced eventually the amendment act was in 2018 okay but you can see from here the structure what are they proposing this all this stuff okay this has received this when this becomes an act it'll become it'll have received the assent of the president etc you look at this it says it shall come into force on such date as the central government may by notification the official gazette appoint okay so the government will appoint a particular date in the official gazette and different dates may be appointed for different provisions of this act okay so the point is that just because something is in the act and it's received the assent of the president it has not come into force it does not have the force of law because most of these acts today are being written in this kind of form so therefore the particular section in order to know whether a particular section in the act is uh, actually has the force of law as of now you have to go and see whether that particular section has been notified by the government by the executive branch okay so the laws are made by the legislative branch uh, formed by the head of the executive branch the president and then the executive branch that is essentially the the, the ruling party in power at that time will decide when to notify particular sections and until they do that they do not have the force of law those sections do not have the force of law so this is some uh, just to give you a real life example of what i was talking about there uh, okay let's go quickly back to hadley versus baxendale okay we've lost two and a half minutes on this side point but i want this to be part of the recording okay all right, so Hadley versus Baxendale, this is a, a landmark case on this topic of remedies for breach of contract. Breach of contract, this is as important to this topic as the Solomon case is to the topic of the separate legal personality of the corporation. Okay, so you can see here briefly the facts. You can see the, the Millers at Gloucester. So these are the plaintiffs. And then you have the repairing company, which is uh, uh, Joyce and Company. They are based in Greenwich. These guys are based in Gloucester and then you have the carriers who are the defendants, Pickford and Company. And so what happens is there's a, the crankshaft of the mill breaks. They want to get a new uh, crankshaft made and the uh, these guys, Joyce and Company, they, need a, they want to work off a prototype. So they require this uh, broken shaft to be sent to Greenwich and Pickford and Company takes money for the transport of this and then they say that they'll deliver it within two days. But in fact, what happens actually is that they don't deliver it until the seventh day. So they've delayed the delivery of this particular shaft. Now, this is the problem here. And the plaintiffs have sued them. That is the Millers. Okay. They have sued them for delay in delivery and uh, they've sued them for lost profits. So they're saying that because the mill was not, the crack shop was not available for a long time. Uh, we are claiming $300, 300 pounds damages for lost profits and the wages that we had to pay to our laborers but we couldn't operate the mills etc so this is uh, this is the state of this situation so now although this case is laying down a very important principle on remedies for breach of contract the technical point on which the case comes to the higher court is actually quite i mean it's, it's quite uh, kind of uh, uh, mundane or a uh, very limited in scope which is the question is uh, what what the defendants have said is the defendants lost in the lower court okay or they had a judgment against them which they didn't like and what the defendants are essentially saying is that the jury instructions were not pro proper okay so if you see what happens that on the first count uh, the defendants have actually denied the first count which is this whole business of between two days and seven days where they said so the first allegation is that uh, they were supposed to deliver in two days and they didn't deliver for seven days. 
So that the defendants have actually, uh, you know, disagreed with. But on the second count, what they have said is in the second count, you see, the plaintiffs are alleging that uh, they did not deliver the shaft within a reasonable time. So on this allegation, the defendants have agreed that we did not deliver it within a reasonable time. And for that, they have delivered. They have paid 25 pounds into court as uh, damages uh, for the second count. Okay. So now what is happening is in addition to that, the, the plaintiffs are also claiming the damages for lost profits. Okay. So on account of that, so and on that point, uh, on the question of damages for lost profits, the jury essentially, in addition to this 25 pounds paid or already paid into court by the plaintiff, by the defendants, the jury additionally, what the jury does in the, in the lower court, okay, what the jury does is they give them a verdict in favor of the plaintiffs for an additional 25 pounds, okay. So they've already got 25 pounds given by the defendants on account of they admit that we did not submit it or we did not deliver it within a reasonable time. In addition to that, on account of the lost profits and stuff like that, uh, the, uh, the jury has found for the uh, plaintiff okay, and given them a da uh, award of 25 pounds. So against this decision, the plaintiffs, uh, the defendants have come up on appeal and their technical point is that the jury instructions were not proper. Now we don't have jury trials in India anymore, but it's common in the US, UK, etc. So uh, now what you have is that uh, the important thing with jury trials is that the jury is supposed to enter a finding of fact and you know find the and, and set certain damages and stuff like that. But uh, the court, the jury has to be properly instructed by the judge. There is still a judge even in a jury trial. The judge makes sure that the uh, the trial is conducted according to proper rules, etc. Okay, so now the judge has to give proper instructions to the jury. So the technical point on which this comes up to the higher court is the defendants are saying that the jury was not properly instructed. Okay, and then you find that the higher court actually agrees with this. Okay, and why does the higher court say that the jury was not properly um, instructed? This is why they say it and this is where I mean the ground on which they come to this conclusion that the jury instructions were not proper is uh, is where you find them laying down this or sort of reaffirming this important rule as to what kind of damages can be claimed uh, for breach of contract. Okay, so you already remember in the notes that we discussed we discussed uh, compensatory damages would be of two types. What are the two types? General yeah, general damages and special damages. Okay. So you have to be careful. I thought I heard you say journal. Sometimes when you say general, sometimes people say it as in it sounds like uh, J O U R N A L. Okay. So you have to be very careful. General. Okay. So you have to say when you say general damages, you have to say general. It should not sound like journal. Okay. I know you like your accounting class, but journal entries, not, not journal, but general. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Um, the point we studied was that the, the theory says that you can claim general damages and special damages. Okay, so general damages are what you would ordinarily uh, are the damages that would ordinarily uh, occur. Okay, uh, would be not ordinarily expected to occur as a consequence of the breach of contract. Okay, which could be normally foreseen by reasonable people as occurring as a consequence of the breach of contract. That is your general damages. Okay, and then you have special damages, which are called consequential damages. Okay, also called consequential damages, which is basically other damages that all kinds of remote and uh, you know indirect damages that may occur because of some special circumstances that prevailed at the time of the formation of the contract as well as the breach of the contract. Is this clear? So what this essentially what the ratio of uh, so your question was what is the ratio descendendi of Hadley versus Baxendale? So briefly, what it is essentially is that. Uh, this is what the rule uh, that is reaffirmed. This is the rule that is reaffirmed in this particular case. Uh, this, this is this is part, the part where you will find the ratio descendi. Okay. So what this what this court is saying is where these two parties make a contract and then one of them breaks the contract. Okay. This is the part. Okay, where we can actually just extract this and paste it into your notes. Okay. So this is essentially the important part of the judgment where they are laying down the ratio and they are essentially saying that ordinarily only general damages can be claimed. Okay, that is only those damages which may have been reasonably foreseen as arising as a consequence of the breach of contract. Is this clear? Is everyone clear about this? Okay, so 
all right so this is the first part of the uh, extract and we can actually uh, okay we can actually just quickly uh, We, we can quickly refer to the second part of the question to understand the full ratio density and answer the first part as well. The second part of the question was, which section of the Indian Contract Act uh, embodies the ratio of Hadley versus Baxendale? I'm sure most of you Googled for this. Did you actually go into the act and look for it? Or you just Googled for it? Okay, you went in and looked for it. Okay, good. Okay, so you can see this is section 73 okay so in a way as i said again the indian contract act obviously does not actually apply to the hadley versus baxendale situation but because this uh, statute having been written by the english in 1872 essentially uh, codifies the english common law of contracts so you'll see many of the important principles as part as sections of the ica and so you can see here what does it say the first paragraph can you see this what is the first paragraph essentially saying the first paragraph is essentially saying that uh general damages may be claimed in case of a breach general damages may be claimed is this clear to everyone yes, sir. that the first paragraph is saying this okay and what is the second paragraph saying of section 73 yeah and so what is the what what is the expression that we can use for indirect remote and indirect losses unforeseeable. Unforeseeable. unforeseeable and so we call them special damages okay so essentially what the first two paragraphs of section 73 essentially embody the ratio of uh, they codify the ratio of Hadley versus Baxendale okay where uh, the first paragraph essentially says that general damages may be claimed and the second paragraph says special damages need may not be claimed in summary if you wanted to just paraphrase those two okay uh, may have you're convinced you you have a question okay okay all right okay so uh, so this is what it says okay first two paragraphs second paragraph essentially saying that general damage special damages may not be claimed okay so by special damages this is what we mean remote and indirect loss of them lo this is actually a typo here it should not be off it should be or okay in remote and indirect loss or damage is this point clear what some of you are not convinced. Kushbu is not convinced that can you see that that off is a typo that should be or you can't have loss of damage if you have loss of damage then the damage has disappeared so you can't claim so it is loss or loss or damage okay so this is why i told you that when you are actually looking at litigation and looking at the actual exact words of the statute if it's the company's act you just go to the ebook of the uh, set out by the mca and that's always going to be accurate otherwise you go to the income tax act website the uh, income tax website and look up look at the actual acts on that website those are maintained by taxmen and those are actually updated okay and they don't have typos all right so indirect loss or damage okay sustained by reason so remote and indirect loss <coughs> or damage sustained by reason of the breach this is essentially a way of referring to what we are calling special damages in the theory this is clear okay so if you can see here this word uh, remote has also appeared in the case itself what is the court what is the case saying here if you notice um, somewhere here that you can see yes can you see this can you see this that the defendants actually have alleged this so this word remote is actually connected to this judgment itself okay in the judgment there is an allegation that there is this particular damage that you're claiming for lost profits okay how were we supposed to know that your mill was not going to be working at all okay uh, and uh, that uh, i mean we knew that the mill was the, we'll see that there is actually a part where what is this guy saying the defendant's clerk here okay so the defendant's clerk the defendant's office told the defendant's clerk okay the servant of the plaintiff okay who went to the defendant's office told the defendant's clerk that the mill was stopped and the shaft must be stepped. so they knew that the mill was stopped but there was no uh, articulation of the 
amount of profits that might have been lost that the fact that there would be lost profits and wages have to be paid to workmen all these factors were all these details were not articulated and made clear to the other party okay so um, the point is that when these guys are saying that this claim for lost profits that's too remote this kind of damage is too remote and we could not have ordinarily contemplated these damages as occurring as a result of the breach okay so the word remote actually comes is connected to the judgment also um, this is our contract act okay so here you can see section 73 first two paragraphs set out the ratio of Hadley versus Baxendale that general damages can be claimed but remote and indirect losses amounting to uh, uh, being labeled normally as uh, special damages cannot be claimed arising from special circumstances okay so that is essentially the ratio of this particular case and you can see here yeah okay this is the thing and where they've talked about okay now here they're saying this is the part where they're elaborating on the other side um, this part okay so special circumstances now they're talking about the special circumstances if, if they were if they were communicated by the plaintiffs to the defendants and thus known to both parties okay so this would be known to them okay okay so this is the part the last part where they're talking about but on the other hand if they were wholly unknown to the party which is the fact in this particular case okay uh, how would the what the court is saying is how is the defendant supposed to have known that all these special circumstances were uh, uh, were prevailing and there would be all these special losses okay so here what you can see something uh, one of the things you can see from this so essentially they're saying that um, if we can just extract a little bit of it here if the special cases are known to both the parties or no? yeah let's just talk about this part but on the other hand this part okay this is the part where the court is essentially saying that um, special damages cannot be claimed if you had not communicated those special circumstances is this clear okay um, right now see where there's an element of fairness in this particular kind of rule as well and for that we are going to introduce this new idea of efficient breach of contract you've heard this concept of efficient breach of contract okay so this idea comes the idea of efficiency you might have you're studying economics yes, you might have uh, come across this term efficiency yes, okay so this idea actually comes from uh, you know the application of economic principles to the analysis of contract law so efficient breach of contract means essentially so the idea is that in breach of contract uh, it's not breach of contract is not something immoral okay it's not something immoral or illegal or, or i mean breach of contract is not illegal what is illegal is if you breach the contract and then the court uh, awards certain damages to the other party and then you don't pay that that is illegal okay so essentially breach of contract is already i mean sort of uh, you know implicitly contemplated by the idea of con by contract law which provides for damages for breach of contract so breach of contract is certainly not immoral okay whether you say it's illegal or it's, it's basically a violation of the terms of the contract but it's not really illegal in the sense it's really an element of private law it's not an element of public law where you know you go and damage public property that's illegal okay so in that sense breach of contract is not illegal so there is this idea of efficient breach of contract so this might happen where efficient breach of contract happens when a party determines that um, it is cheaper for that party to pay the damages for breach of contract than to actually go through the <coughs> hassle and the expense of performing the contract okay like somebody might have taken up a contract to build something in a particular area and they might find that because of some reason their resources they don't have resources in that area something happens maybe they don't they a lot of their laborers resign and uh, they lose some kind of subcon some subcon some contractors so they have a resource problem in that particular area so they might find that for them to actually perform that contract and construct that building in that particular area it would cost them so much money that is actually cheaper to uh, just breach the contract to perform construct that building and pay the damages whatever the court decides are reasonable damages for breach of contract 
Are you following this idea? Yes. Sir. That essentially you can just uh, take a, you can say it's a calculating approach to uh, to uh, the idea of contractual obligations. You determine that it's actually cheaper for you to breach the contract and pay the damages, okay, whatever the court decides, than to actually go through the hassle of performing the contract. So this can happen, okay, and this is not immoral or anything like that. So this is called efficient breach of contract, where you essentially determine that it's too costly for you to perform the contract and it's cheaper for you to pay the damages. And this is quite, this is absolutely legal. Okay, there's nothing illegal about it. Okay, so this brings us to the, so why am I introducing the idea of efficient breach of contract? Now, why does the court come up with this rule? Can you see this? It says, unless you have actually communicated the special circumstances, you cannot claim special damages. You can only claim general damages. Okay, so can you see why this is connected to the idea of efficient breach and the idea of fairness? Okay. So if you see that if we have the Hadley versus Baxendale rule, okay, what does it do for us? Okay, essentially see, think about this. If we allowed a party to claim special damages, okay, for breach of contract, like if we allowed uh, these guys, uh, the, the millers, okay, if we allowed the millers to claim the 300 pounds for the lost profits, okay despite the fact that they have not com communicated all these detailed special circumstances about wages payment to payment of wages to laborers and loss of profits okay from not being able to run the mill okay they have not communicated any of this to the shippers okay but in spite of that they claim they are allowed to recover this pro lost profit amount okay then if you think about it suppose the shippers actually were Act, when they were delayed by seven days, then they promised they would deliver it in two days, but they delivered the shaft in only seven days. Now, maybe the shippers actually had a problem. Maybe they were suddenly the horses died and then they didn't have another wagon. Okay. And they might have determined, okay, because they were not aware of any special circumstances. So they might have thought that, okay, we, we know normally what we would have to pay, what would be the normal damages from this kind of a breach. We are going to have to breach the contract because it's not worth our while to go and hire extra horses and extra wagons from somewhere else and then make sure we ship the crankshaft to Greenwich on time okay the time that we promised these guys let's just breach the contract and we know that we are going to have to pay only general damages because nothing has been told to us about special circumstances are you following the logic yes sir. okay so why is this rule fair why is the Hadley versus Baxendale rule fair it's very fair if you see it especially in the context of the accepted idea of efficient breach of contract. So the shippers might have had some extenuating circumstances that they were faced with and they might have taken a, a decision that, okay, in this case, it's actually cheaper for us because I know that I only have to pay normal, I only have to pay general damages, okay, which I can normally foresee as a consequence of the breach of this contract. And I don't have to pay special damages, so that's not a lot of, amount of, lot of money to pay. And it's actually cheaper for me to pay that than to go through the trouble of hiring extra horses and extra wagons from somewhere else and making sure that I uh, deliver on the contract terms to the millers. Is this point clear? Okay, so that might have been the calculation of the shippers, Pickford and Company. So because that might have been the company, uh, calculation of the shippers, that's why it's unfair to impose on them this liability for special damages where when these special circumstances had not been communicated to them. Is this clear? You understand the idea of fairness? Okay, everything has to be, all legal principles have to be fair, have to be seen as fair. Okay, so this is, uh, and it's also this introduces this idea of uh, efficient breach of contract. Okay, because uh, it allows for uh, the possibility of efficient breach of contract. And if you combine that with the idea of fairness, you can see why this uh, Hadley versus Baxendale rule is a just rule okay all right so far everyone's clear any questions okay now we're gonna learn uh, so this is essentially it right if you go back to the questions that you were asked what is the ratio desert India of Hadley versus Baxendale and what is the section of the uh, ICA that embodies this ratio the second part is section 73 first two paragraphs and then the first part is essentially this that you can only claim general damages uh, you cannot claim, claim special damages if you have not communicated the special circumstances. Okay, so this is essentially the brief answer to your to the specific questions that you were asked. Now we'll get into the other learnings from this case. Yes. 
yeah go ahead use the mic yeah so like uh, you said you talked about efficient breach of contract uh the party knows that uh, the breach of contract will be efficient that is what we have assumed in this case okay uh, no no we have not assumed i've just said that i've just kind of constructed a hypothetical we don't really know because in the facts of the case it does not say anything about uh because hadley versus i mean when the uh, shippers come with the plea to the higher court that the jury instructions were not proper okay so essentially what let's say before we go into the other learnings from this case okay finally what does the court decide if you see the court's decision on in this case the ultimate decision is actually quite a mundane decision what is the point that the uh, defendants have raised okay they have obtained a rule nisi for a new trial rule nisi means essentially a decree nisi is essentially a decree which is uh, if which is a temporary kind of decree and it will become permanent if there is no objection within a certain period of time okay so sometimes in divorce you obtain a decree nisi for divorce where uh, if there is no objection after a certain point of time then the decree becomes final it doesn't become final immediately but you wait for a little bit of time to elapse so if you don't have to worry about rule nisi but the defendants were essentially saying that uh we want a new trial because the jury instructions the instructions to the jury were not proper okay and so the court agrees the higher court agrees with the defendants and says that if you look at the end of the case therefore what is saying that judge ought to have told the jury that uh they ought not to take the loss of profits into consideration at all in estimating the damages okay because of the rule in hanley versus baxendale that special damages cannot be claimed unless the special circumstances had been committed communicated to the uh, other party at the time of formation of the contract okay so this is the rule of hadley versus baxendale which they affirm and they are saying that the jury instructions were not proper and they should now give be the jury should now be given fresh instructions in line with this principle and therefore there must be a new trial this was the particular mundane point raised in this particular case all right so we don't really know anything about the facts I mean, when i'm talking about efficient breach of contract we don't really know anything about the facts of this particular case it does not say anything that uh, about the fact that uh, the shippers actually uh, engaged in efficient breach it does not say that i'm just saying that suppose that they had okay it's a hypothetical i'm just saying that suppose that they had why is the rule in hadley versus baxendale fair because it in order to allow for efficient breach of contract and in order to be fair you need to have this kind of a rule <coughs> okay because in any situation a party is entitled in any situation a party to a contract is entitled to engage in efficient breach okay unless of course the other party can go and uh you know get a decree for specific performance remember the other side of it remember when we looked at uh, breach of contract where is the other side i don't need this time table thing here now in the lay in the layout that we have for our calc sheet remember where the contracts which are not voidable okay either it will become void a contract which becomes void okay like ronaldo's contract with real madrid cannot be enforced because he has a horrific accident which and loses the use of his legs so there is impossibility of performance that's a contract which becomes void if that doesn't happen then you go to no and then you have this so either you would perform the contract and discharge your liabilities or you would breach the contract in which case the non breaching in which case the uh, the non breaching party can claim either damages or it can go for specific performance remember we discussed under the hindu marriage act there is restitution of conjugal rights where the husband is not asking for money from the wife he is only demanding that the wife be asked to specifically perform the marriage contract by coming and living with him in the marital home that is specific performance so unless you talk about specific performance in which case efficient breach does not apply okay so official breach will apply only in a situation where the other party can't successfully get specific performance okay where we are really talking about being in the realm of damages and here and then we can actually write down this element which is um general and special okay all right okay
Okay, actually it will be OR because and they will not have a situation where you have both. Because the special damages, if it exists, will cover uh, the entire I mean, amount estimated. Okay, all right. So, uh, are you following here? Now, sorry, a long uh, interruption to your question. But uh, I, what I wanted to clarify is that my point about efficient breach in the case of Hadley versus Baxendale is only in the form of a hypothetical. Uh, to, to, uh, and I, what I was saying is that every party is entitled to contemplate efficient breach and engage in efficient breach. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you partly answer. What is the fully answer? There's no partly answer. <laughs> like some people say when I ask, why well, is this point clear? Because it's too embarrassing to say that it's not clear because people will think you're stupid because you haven't understood the question or you haven't understood the point. So most, mo the most common answer is, <laughs> yeah, I have uh, partly understood. Okay, so that's, you know, does, uh, takes care of everything. <laughs> you're being truthful at the same time, you're not appearing to be a fool. Only a part fool. Okay. Okay. All right. Yes. So what I was asking was that uh, you talked about action breach of contract. Is that possible that if a party uh, uh, thinks that we only have to pay a part of damages because there was no special damages or uh, uh, there was no uh, special damages declared by the other party? So special circumstances were not communicated by the other party yeah. at the time of formation of the contract. Yeah. So we are only liable to pay general damages. Yeah. So yes. is that possible that uh, the court uh, may declare in future that uh, efficient damages are not applicable, the other party has to pay more, more uh, to the... No, there is no such efficient damages, efficient breach of contract, you are saying. I think I, 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 okay, so what is the confusion exactly? I think what you're saying is that the court may, uh, what the court may see, if you're talking about efficient breach, okay, in this kind of a situation, okay, it could also happen where uh, special damage, special circumstances have been con have been uh, communicated. Maybe if we discuss the liquidated damages part, then you, your question might become clearer. Okay, let's discuss that. Okay, so it's going to be a very long discussion of this point, but there are some important points that we have to understand. So Hadley versus Baxendale, although it's a very important case on remedies for breach of contract, the technical point in the case is very mundane. Whether there should be a new trial or not, whether the jury instructions were not proper or not. Okay. And the court says, and the court says that yes, jury instructions were not proper, so there should be a new trial. So the actual decision is very mundane. Okay. Now, if you take the rule in Hadley versus Baxendale, now go back to the judgment. Okay. So we have already extracted on all, all this stuff, right? If the special circumstances were uh, not known, what is the part that we extracted um, here? If the special circumstances were wholly unknown, okay to the party breaking the contract. This is where they're talking about. You can't claim special damages if this, this is the case. Okay. The, they were not communicated. You can't claim special damages. Okay. Now let's look at the next part of it. Uh, so far it's clear to everybody. Any other questions? Okay. Now let's look at the second part. The, let's look at this last part here with the court is talking about. Okay. Look at these three lines from this paragraph. Okay. I think I've already copied this into this. Yeah, this is the part that I'm talking about. What is the court referring to here? Okay. Um, let's put this here. So here the court is actually talking. This part is not essential to the decision in the case because it's the hypothetical. Okay. What the court is actually anticipating or alluding to here is what is called a liquidated damages clause okay it's a new term that you have to learn uh, in contract law for on the topic of uh, damages for breach of contract there's something called a liquidated damages clause okay and what is that clause essentially it is this okay if you see this okay if you see essentially this applies to special circumstances because remember when you're talking about general damages there is no requirement to really mention anything in the contract because General damages apply to uh, situations where, I mean, the court is going to estimate normally uh, the losses that may normally arise from such a breach of contract. Okay, in the normal, in the usual course of events. Okay, so there is no need to as, as specifically refer to a particular sum in the contract. Okay, because uh, in every situation where there is a breach, the court will just estimate 
what would have normally uh, what is the damages that would have normally accrued from such a breach of contract okay and the normal course of events okay the language that they are using here what does it say here fairly and reasonably arising naturally according to the usual course of things from such breach of contract itself okay this is where we are talking about general damages okay so general damages since they can be understood reasonably there is an idea that they can be fairly estimated uh, by all parties okay and the court itself can also reasonably determine what this number should be so there is no need to mention anything uh, as far as claiming uh, uh, general damages goes okay but if there are special circumstances that are communicated to the other party at the beginning of the at the formation of the contract at the time of formation of the contract now what happens is in this kind of a situation there are special circumstances and both parties agree ahead of time at the time of the formation of the contract that okay these are the special circumstances that are prevailing and we both agree that if you like let's see if you take a construction contract okay where typically these liquidated damages clauses will be on a per day basis okay so you would say that you got to construct this building by say uh, within the next nine months and for every day of delay in execution of the contract you will have to pay me five thousand dollars so they agree the parties agree ahead of time both the builder and the person who's uh, giving out the contract okay both of them agree ad ahead of time that because of the circumstances i think it's fair we think it's fair that if there is a delay in the in the execution of the contract and for every day of delay the uh, defaulting party should uh, will pay five thousand dollars per day to the uh, person who's put out the contract so it's clear okay so this kind of a thing is this is what is called a liquidated damages clause what is happening here is the parties are estimating they are aware of special circumstances they're estimating ahead of time they are trying to estimate it's a situation where you have special circumstances okay but it's difficult to kind of estimate accurately what the actual future damages would be it's a situation where you have uh, you know you can't estimate ahead of time what the actual losses will be if there is a breach of contract it's a little difficult to estimate so these parties come up with a rough estimate ahead of time at the time of formation of the contract to avoid disputes in the future also because it's hard to establish how much has been actually lost and things like that okay is this clear so you have a situation where there are special circumstances plus it's a little difficult to estimate accurately what will be the actual damages so you don't want to get into this fight after the breach of contract you don't want to get into a fight where this party is saying i've lost so much money and the other party is saying no you haven't lost this much money you only lost much less than that so this kind of to avoid all these hassles what the parties will do is they'll agree to a figure ahead of time that if there is a breach of contract the defaulting party will pay five thousand dollars per day as an example okay uh, so in a construction contract let's say okay so are you following what we are discussing here yes, sir. this kind of a clause okay is called a liquidated damages clause okay <clears throat> So this is what we mean by liquidated damages. Okay, just read this and try to understand. <coughs> and then read the part in caps where I've talked about liquidated damages. And then see this extract from the judgment in uh, <coughs> running hand here. For had the special circumstances been known. So see that in this part of the judgment, the court is actually alluding to the liquidated damages clause, which is not there in this case. They are, it's a hypothetical because the court is saying for had the special clause, had it been known. <coughs> are you following? Is this clear now? So what, the, what do you mean by ahead of contracts? ahead of actual breach because at the at the time of formation of the contract there is no breach because at the time of formation you are just agreeing on the terms of the contract okay that is when you are forming this uh, consensus added in meeting of the minds the formation of the contract okay uh, the contract comes into being okay like we discussed that question of in in uh, pharmaceutical society versus great britain uh, uh, of great britain versus boots cash chemists one of the questions was the central question was 
at what point is the contract formed what act at what point does contract formation take place when the shopper picks up the good from the aisle or when the cashier accepts the cash payment okay so this question is always important at what point is the contract formed so at the point of formation of the contract there is no question of a breach because the contract is just being formed okay yes any other yeah go ahead so uh, you said mike mike what happened Yeah. So, uh, uh, over here, as you it's okay. Don't worry. Loud is okay. No, I'm loud actually. Don't, don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. like uh, we said that uh, if the party will uh, breach and if it, if the party will delay the contract, he has to pay a uh, five thousand dollars per day. So, if the party breaches the breaches the contract before the actual date, so is he liable to pay five thousand? What actual date? So there must be some actual date of uh, completion okay, of okay, the contract. Okay, okay, fine. I okay, I understand. No, no, you are talking about some other kind of breach. Yes. We have talked about this liquidated damages clause covers uh, only that type of breach which is represented by delayed execution. Okay. So the example I gave you is an example of where. The liquidated damages clause covers only uh, that type of breach that is represented by delayed execution. That is, you are supposed to construct the building in six months, but you do construct the building, but you take seven months. And so, if that, if you are talking about that kind of a situation where there is some other breach of contract, where the party just does not construct the building, takes an advance payment, does not construct the building, okay, or stops constructing after two uh, couple of months. Okay, so in that case, the actual completion date of the contract has not arrived, but the party is in breach. Now that's a different kind of breach. Okay, that's also a breach. So there might have been a liquidated damages clause covering that type of breach also. Okay, you could have had that type of breach also covered. The point is that you can have many of these clauses covering all kinds of breaches. The point here essentially is that the point about the liquidated damages clause is that. Uh, it uh, shows that the parties had already con contemplated these, both parties were aware, were aware of these special circumstances and they had already applied their mind to it and they had agreed on a particular sum that would be paid if such breaches were to occur by the breaching party. I mean it would be paid by the breaching party. That's the idea. So you can add different types of breach. I only discussed one type of breach that is delayed execution. You can have other types of breach also. Okay. All right. Now, can you guys also see that in this part of the judgment, for had the special circumstances been known, this is where the court is anticipating or alluding to liquidated damages clauses. Can you see this? Is it apparent or not? Parties might have specially provided for the breach of contract by special terms as to damages in that. <clears throat> what is that? This would have been a liquidated damages clause. Okay, so you understand that this is another thing that we can just like in the Carlyle versus Carbolic smoke ball case. The court discussed the idea of contra proferentum. Remember, you've forgotten now what contra proferentum is. How is it possible? I discussed. Contra proferentum was not discussed. Not contra proferentum. Contra proferentum. One minute. Contra proferentum was discussed in the Carlyle versus Carbolic smoke ball case. Go back and listen to the recording. It might even be in your notes. I think I put it in your notes as well. Contra proferentum means interpretation. I, I'm 100% sure I put it in your notes. It means interpretation against the draftsman. I warned you for those of you who are going to intern in HR departments in your summer that you would be involved in drafting employment contracts. Yes. Yes. You might be involved in drafting employment contracts, in which case it is your duty to uh, second guess the HR department or the legal department and ensure that there are no ambiguous clauses in the employment contracts. Because if there are ambiguous clauses in the employment contracts, then the, if there is a dispute between the employer and the employee, how would the court construe the ambiguous clause? Against the employer or the employee? 
employer. employer. Why? Because he has drafted. Because he has drafted the contract. That is what is the meaning. That is what contra profanitum means. Contra, that is opposite to the person who is offering. That is the person who is giving, uh, who is drafting the contract and offering the contract to the other party. So contra profanitum was discussed, and it was also mentioned that in the Carlyle versus Carbolic Smoke Ball Company case, the court had the discussion about contemplated the question of applying this doctrine without actually using the Latin expression contra profanitum. That's not mentioned in the judgment, but the court is actually talking about whether we should whether we should construe the terms of this advertisement most strongly against the person making the offer. Remember that? In the Carlyle case, you've forgotten all this stuff. The smoke ball com company advertisement, right? So this point was discussed. The point I'm trying to make here is that it is similar to the Carlyle case because in that case where there is a particular principle that is being discussed by the court but they don't use the Latin expression for that ex for that principle. They don't use the words contra profanitum, but they discuss the idea of contra profanitum in that case. And similarly here also the court is not using the liquidated damages expression, but it is actually talking about liquidated damages. When it says that if the special circumstances had been known, then the parties might have actually agreed uh, between themselves and specially provided for the for such a for such damages in case of breach by special terms as to damages in that case are you following what most of the responses are people are already half dead not even lunch time <laughs> yes are you following or no okay very muted responses <laughs> like your breakfast was not sufficient yes okay <laughs> all right okay so is this point clear this is another learning from this case that we can use this uh, very minor uh, allusion to the idea of liquidated damages clauses which the court makes in its judgment because it doesn't need to do that for this particular decision it's not part of the ratio decidendi but you can use this uh, little uh, reference to learn about this new term called liquidated damages okay all right the liquidated damages clause okay all right now let's look at one more thing where another question which i could have asked you which i did not okay which is uh, where exactly um, in which in which section of the indian contract act uh, uh, you know does it provide for liquidated damages okay to save you the time i'll yeah it is 74 okay now just read this for yourself and try to uh, you know <coughs> assure yourself that, that my statement is correct that section 74 of the indian contract act talks about liquidated damages clauses can you see read the first paragraph just read the first uh, two lines Can you see this? Yes. That this is liquid. It doesn't say actually come. Section 74 doesn't say it doesn't come with a heading saying liquidated damages. Okay. But this is what they're talking about. This is what is called liquidated damages. Okay. So another point to note is this that section 74. So another learning is that again, as you can see here, all the provisions of English contract law are codified in the Indian Contract Act somewhere or the other. And you can see this here. Okay. Now another point to note. So one thing you learn, yes. Give him the mic. I know you your voice is loud enough, but let's still use the mic. Yes. Oh, I know you get nervous using the mic. So you have to make we have to make you use the mic. No, but the other day he was saying that he was sweating. Sir, that is because of the case, not that's because of the case, okay. You're not nervous. Okay. I thought you were nervous in general. Yes, okay. So what does uh, this mean that any other stipulation by the way of penalty? Yeah, we'll come to that. Okay, first make sure that you understand that section 74 provides for liquidated damages clauses. Okay, so his second question is uh, what is the difference? What, is, what does it mean by way of penalty? Okay, all right, look at this here where we are talking about. So there is a difference between 
Um, yeah. Now, so liquidated damages clauses. Now we have understood what is a liquidated damages clause. Okay. What happened? You fell down or you were just uh, okay. All right. So what is a liquidated damages clause? You understood now. Okay. Now you notice that this this the, this particular term liquidated damages is discussed uh, alongside the idea of a penalty in this, in section 74. Liquidated damages is discussed alongside the idea of a penalty. So the Indian contract Indian contract law provides for okay or okay either liquidated damages or if the contract contains any other stipulation by way of penalty okay then what happens the party who is non-breaching who's complaining of the breach okay can claim okay some reasonable compensation not exceeding the amount so named or not exceeding the penalty okay not exceeding the amount so named or not exceeding the penalty now let's just on the point of liquidated damages versus penalty Typically, what happens in, in, in uh, international uh, uh, regimes, okay, the UK, US, okay, they will not allow uh, the enforcement of penalty. So, there's a difference between liquidated damages and penalty. The idea of a penalty is that it is generally seen as being very unreasonable. The amount is unreasonable, okay, whereas liquidated damages clauses are normally expected to be reasonable. That is, if you have a construction contract where there's a $5,000 per day penalty for uh, uh, provision for liquidated damages. For delayed execution then it is understood i mean it is expected that that amount of liquidated damages mentioned in the contract will be such amount which most people will see as reasonable in the light of those special circumstances okay but sometimes what happens is that there are penalty clauses which are so big that now diksha and uh, mehak will lose points because they are con uh, con playing with each other <laughs> whatever i don't know what they're doing diksha has made a funny drawing and uh, she's expecting may have to appreciate it okay where is this team is gunjan is uh, okay where is diksha where is yeah okay this one okay all right so you will oh you've opened your account now wonderful okay good okay so liquidated damages versus penalty understand something liquidated damages well brief understanding is we can just make it simple we can do make it simplistic and this is this is seen as reasonable okay obviously spelling of reasonable is not correct yeah, yeah i'm just going to use google and save myself time okay all right okay and then i'm going to write please don't write unreasonable like this but i want to write it like this because i want to sort of make it clear to you that it's unreasonable okay so this is not the way to write unreasonable obviously okay so liquidated damages how do you distinguish between the two typically that, that uh, it's not a hard and fast scientific distinction but the general idea is that liquidated damages provision will be such that the amounts would be seen as reasonable in the light of the special circumstances but in a business setting you can estimate that okay this is a reasonable amount to claim as liquidated damages okay but if you see certain amounts being mentioned in the contract as payable okay if in case of breach and the amounts are seen to be very unreasonable okay punitive excessive amounts of damages being written into the contract okay and the court looks at it and thinks that this is not reasonable this is not a reasonable commercial estimate of what might be the damages in these special circumstances even though there are special circumstances the court everyone knows that but even then you can determine what is a reasonable amount to claim in those special circumstances and what is an unreasonable excessive you know punitive amount which is being put in there <coughs> only to punish the breaching party okay so if the court sees this is the tradition in the uh, english uh, in the other countries in the other anglo-saxon countries that if the court determines that there is this clause is the amount is so big that it amounts to a penalty clause it's not a liquidated damages clause because it's very unreasonable it does not seem to be a commercially reasonable amount notwithstanding the special circumstances okay so in that case the court will not enforce them okay generally in the other anglo-saxon countries the court will not in, uh, in, uh, enforce the uh, limit, uh, penalty clauses it will enforce only liquidated damages clauses okay now the idea here is this this is how you would distinguish now why do they not enforce penalty clauses because 
the idea is that you cannot use because contract law is commercial law okay contract law is commercial law so you cannot use commercial law to punish people okay so the other thing we say that commercial contract law is what is called private law okay in the sense it generally governs the contract conduct of private parties so you cannot use the commercial law to punish people the punishment of people is the job of criminal law so it should be left to the criminal law to punish people so you can't use the commercial law to punish people that's why the court will not enforce clauses which are seen as you know containing excessive amounts which are in the native nature of punitive damages penalty damages uh, rather than uh, reasonable liquidated damages for those special circumstances this is clear another thing to understand okay now on the face of it it appears okay so this is the tradition in the other anglo-saxon countries uh, other than india okay now look at it we can refer to india as an anglo-saxon country because we have our legal we, the legal system is from england effectively our de facto national language is english because that's the only language you can use everywhere in the country so we can effectively treat ourselves as a semi-anglo-saxon country okay all right now look at this what does it say here Although the Indian con uh, Indian contract law on the face of it does not appear to make a distinction between liquidated damages clauses, which are here, and the penalty clauses which are here, okay, doesn't seem to distinguish because it says party can claim. But indirectly, it does ensure that penalty clauses can't be enforced because why? Why does it do that? Look at this. What does it say here? It says that, uh, w what are you entitled to recover? Damn. You can only recover reasonable compensation not exceeding the amount, okay? So named or the amount of the penalty stipulated for. So this word, this part qualifies both the liquidated damages clause and the penalty clause, okay? So notice that just because you have 5,000, uh, let's say 5 million rupees per day as your damages liquidated damages and that's a reasonable amount okay but even then it's not seen as a penalty clause in india it does not matter as such when you uh, what it is seen as but what will happen in india is that just because you've spent the parties have agreed to five million rupees per day of delay okay doesn't mean that the parties can claim five million rupees per day of delay when they go to court the court will say that uh, i will give you reasonable compensation not exceeding the 5 million rupees per day which you have written are you following what does the law say here does it say you can claim the amount that is stated does it say that you can claim the amount that is stated no you can claim reasonable compensation not exceeding the amount which means it could be less than the amount it can be the same exact amount it could be it could be but the point is that the operative uh, word is not what you have the operative uh, idea is not what you have what will prevail is not what you have put into the contract you may have put 5 million rupees per day into the contract but there is no guarantee of getting that what is only guarantee is of getting something that the court considers reasonable up to that amount when both the parties agree to some amount before uh, and it is registered in the contract so need not be registered contracts don't have to be registered like liquidated damages as discussed and with the consent of yeah. both the parties they come to a particular amount so i don't think court should interfere with okay them. good very good when you're saying when you're using the word should are you making a normative statement or a positive statement no. what is he doing is he making a positive or a normative statement no. No. Some says positive, some say normative. normative. Who is saying positive? Now nobody will raise their hands. <laughs> okay, so he's making a normative statement. Okay, so very good point. Okay, we can use his point. But let's understand first before we depart on to this uh, other detour. Let's use this point raised by... Uh, so before we get on to the point raised by Rajan, let's understand this clearly that under the Indian law, although on the face of it it appears that we don't make a distinction between penalty clauses and, and uh, liquidated damages clauses which other anglo-saxon countries do okay but indirectly the indian law also prevents unreasonable punitive amounts uh, from being claimed because what does the law say that you can only claim you are only entitled to receive reasonable compensation not exceeding the amount uh, uh, so named okay or the penalty name uh, specified is this clear are you following yes. 
so you are not guaranteed to get the amount you have written down in the contract okay you will only get up to that amount whatever the court considers reasonable that is the point to understand so indirectly what happens is because the court is there to act as a check on what is a reasonable amount okay effectively you can say the court will uh, the court is empowered to ensure that punitive excessive uh, penalty clauses are not being enforced are you following are you following what i'm saying Karan is not convinced you didn't follow so what am i saying i'm saying that on the face of it now we know that in the other anglo-saxon countries uh, there is a clear uh, distaste for penalty clauses okay uh, but indirectly and whereas on the indian uh, when you look at the indian law on the face of it it appears uh, that both penalty clauses and uh, liquidated damages clauses will be enforced okay so it seems like we don't distinguish between the two but in fact actually the two are being equalized by this particular expression here reasonable compensation not exceeding either the amount named or the penalty stipulated for which means even if you put in a penalty clause which is excessive punitive okay exorbitant kind of a number which is meant to punish the other party okay and is not commercially reasonable there is no guarantee of your getting that amount the only thing you're guaranteed to get is what the court would consider reasonable in the circumstances okay so the unreasonable is normally remember we associate penalty clauses with being unreasonable okay unreasonable punitive excessive uh, amounts okay meant to punish the other party okay so this is so we're learning about a lot of things liquidated damages distinction between liquidated damages clauses and penalty clauses the distinctions between the other anglo-saxon countries and the way our law is written but then eventually you find that they're actually eventually essentially going to end up being the same because even in india you can't claim unreasonable amounts okay all right now coming to uh rajan's point which is a very important point that he has raised which is the point of freedom of contract remember we, we discussed this expression at the very beginning of your contract law module now you've forgotten this just like you forgot about contra profanity which came at the beginning in the middle of the module somewhere so you must have forgotten about this also you forgotten about carlyle versus carbolic smoke ball even though it's winter now we should be trying out these carbolic smoke balls okay all right now so what is happening here uh, freedom of contract you remember or not you don't remember freedom of contract hmm? yeah parties can enter into contract but more importantly the parties can set the terms of their contract okay the parties are set i mean as long as you're competent to contract parties are free if you if you believe in freedom of contract this is associated with capitalist uh, capitalism okay free markets normally you'll find that markets and uh, deregulation okay well essentially less regulated economy so i'm just using a short word like deregulation so you'll find that those countries or those uh, cultures which are tend to be more oriented towards uh, the importance of uh, you know individual uh, free individual freedom okay uh, then uh, capitalist uh, oriented uh, uh, economies that are oriented towards capitalism free markets okay the De- less regulation limited government all these ideas okay all these are essentially in many ways you could say these are kind of western ideas because you don't really find them in the occidental societies okay but all western countries are not like this okay so like the europeans are not so much like this america used to be like this but is becoming more and more socialistic but anyway so the point is freedom of contract the important principle that rajan has highlighted is two parties have agreed to a sum now the court should not interfere okay when the court interferes it is essentially an interference with freedom of contract because we have determined in our wisdom that under the circumstances this is the amount that should be paid now who is the court to come and interfere and determine that this sum is not reasonable okay this amounts to interfere with interference with freedom of contract okay so you will find essentially that where there is interference with freedom of contract it will it will essentially end up um interference with freedom of contract will basically stifle innovation can you see how it's going to stifle innovation stifle means to sort of squelch to restrict okay restrict the growth of okay 
innovation. And you see innovation, what is innovation? Innovation means you come up with new products, new services, okay? Insurance, like insurance, for instance, and the other class I gave the example of insurance where nowadays you see disability insurance is covered, like, you know, it covers kind of any part of the body, okay? But if you wanted disability insurance only for, some, maybe somebody cares only if he goes blind. So he wants only insurance for going blind. He doesn't want the hand cut off, leg cut off, doesn't matter anything to him. It, that doesn't matter to him. He only cares about going, going, going blind. Now, obviously buying insurance only against blindness will cost less. Okay, because the other things could have happened in multiple ways. Okay, but going blind probability just is less than any of these things happening. Okay, blindness, loss of arm, loss of this. Now, obviously, but he would want that. That would be cheaper for him. Okay, so he could operate his business maybe with a cheaper insurance. Then an insurance company which is innovative will be able to offer that kind of service. Okay, but if you have over regulation, government coming and telling you what kind of contracts you can offer, what kind of contracts you can't offer. Okay, all these kinds of things, whenever governments interfere with freedom of contract, it tends to stifle innovation. Okay, so essentially it will basically lead to, uh, you know, less, less dynamic economies okay less prosperous less uh, less economic prosperity so you have to see how all these things are connected when you have interference with freedom of contract you stifle innovation it will lead to uh, diminished economic prosperity all these things are connected okay and then you have to also look into your own culture and see if you see that in india we have a more of a uh, patriarchal culture there is a tendency here and there is a more socialistic mindset so you'll see here that uh, in the government will tend to interfere a lot with freedom of contracts. Okay, we are a heavily regulated economy. Okay, so all these things have an impact on how much economic prosperity we can uh, experience. All these things are connected. So now another point I want to emphasize is you can see clearly as Rajan has uh, highlighted that in the Indian law, we are allowing, allowing for judicial interference with the freedom of contract. Can you see that? because you don't get the entire money that the entire sum that uh, you don't get the entire sum that um, you only get that you have stipulated for you only get reasonable compensation not exceeding the amount so the court can come in and interfere with the freedom of contract this is clear to everyone you can see this okay now look at a statement in the case uh, go back to the statement from Hadley versus Baxendale what is the court saying here? If you don't believe me, it, you can see that it's actually there in the judgment. Okay. Had the special circumstances, they might have specially provided, the parties might have specially provided by special terms as to damages in that case. And of this advantage, it would be very unjust to deprive them. You see the structure of this sentence? When you read this sentence, do you think that this court is of a mindset which will lead them to interfere with freedom of contract or to leave it alone you're following my question is the question too complicated is it clear when you read this statement can you see this yash is not convinced my question is clear okay that kushbu is also not convinced okay so when you read this kind of statement you can see clearly that the the English courts, okay, it shows you a characteristic of the English courts, one of the reasons why uh, a tiny island nation became such a dominant global power, okay. Main, one of the main reasons they were able to do that is, is uh, commercial prosperity, how they became good traders and, you know, how they prospered. And one element of that is the English legal system where the English courts have been very formalistic in their approach to the law and very careful about not interfering with freedom of contract. So English courts have this tradition and you can see here the respect for, uh, you know, commercial traditions and the freedom of contract. They're saying that the court should not, essentially what they're saying is, you can see this, that this is the kind of court which is very unlikely to interfere with freedom of contract because you're saying that we should not deprive them of this advantage, that they have specified these terms, so we should leave them alone and let them have these terms, which they have agreed to. Is this clear now? Okay, so you can see here all these elements uh, of the... Uh, of the case which can be brought out if we go beyond just understanding the ratio of the case all right so this eventually goes down to so this uh, the point is that interference is uh, so the the uh, tradition of uh, non-interference okay so the english legal tradition of of 
non interference with freedom of contract in english uh, in the english courts okay tradition of non interference with it with freedom of contract um in the english court No, actually that is not so much an interference of freedom of contract actually because it's really uh, based on, see, because you can't have contracts which violate basic principles of contract law. The point was in that particular case, one of the points being made was that uh, if you have a clause, if that clause were to apply to contracts for which, okay, if that clause were to apply to uh, contracts or amounts, were to apply to amounts for which specific orders had already been placed, then that would amount to undermining uh, the contract which has been already uh, entered into because that would, those clauses would be void if they purported to employ, apply to, con uh, to amounts for which orders have already been placed because the fundamental principles of contract law cannot be escaped. So once you place an order for a specific quantity that results in the formation of a particular contract. So then you cannot put a clause which tends to go in which would want to go into that contract and render the contract void because your obligation would be then nullified by that clause. So that you cannot do. So that's not correct to say that that represents interference with freedom of contract. This would be a better example where you have this kind of a situation where the court is interfering with, uh, where the law itself allows for that. Okay. All right. Okay. So your lunch is approaching. Okay. What can we give you as an appetizer? We can, as an appetizer, we can discuss some other things. What else can we discuss? Okay, one minute, one minute.